study bioacoustics, breeding behaviors, and the impacts of noise pollution on birds, and the reason she's here tonight, the breeding ecology and conservation of the greater sage grouse. She may be the only academic involved in ornithology whose research has been written about in publications like Wired and Popular Mechanics. And now she's here to tell us about it. Welcome. Hello, thank you. So I'll go ahead and get my screen going here. Okay, so can, let's see. We're in edit mode. You can see? Edit, oh, there you go. All right. We're good. Um, let me get, just figure out where I want things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, so today I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to give you a, a quick overview of a lot of the research that's happening in my lab. I'm not going to get into too much depth in any one project, so you won't get a bunch of figures, though. If anyone's interested in the figures, I'm happy to send you the papers I'll talk about. But all this work is done with my graduate students and postdocs and other folks in my lab that all kind of acknowledge and have photos of them as we go along. And let's see, there we go. Okay, so, uh, so Darwin's theory of natural selection is of course very powerful explaining the evolution of all sorts of traits, including camouflage coloration. So can you guys see my pointer moving around there yes. at all? Yeah, okay. Um, and these are three famously camouflaged organisms that um, I'm guessing you spotted the bird, but the other ones are a little harder to see. <laughs> um, the bird is the common patu right here with a chick. Um, and then we have the a common baron's caterpillar, which is right in the middle of the leaf, hiding in plain sight. And this is a leaf-tailed gecko. So those are just three extraordinary examples of, of um, evolution by natural selection leading to adaptations that allow animals to survive. Uh, but it's harder, it was harder, at least early on, for Darwin to explain traits like the peacocks. And so this was a big problem for Darwin. And there's some really interesting history. After he proposed his theory of natural selection, people kept saying, what about the peacock? And he has this great letter that he wrote to a friend where he says, uh, every time I look at the peacock's tail, I feel sick. Um, and so, you know, he was a sickly guy, but, uh, but it was a hard problem for him to solve. But he came up with the solution to the problem, which is his theory of sexual selection. And so it proposes that these elaborate display traits like the eye spots um, and the shimmering train and everything else that these guys do are about competition for mates. And so um, about uh, being sexier than the other guy and competing for access to territories and resources. And so we now know that the reason that the peacock looks like this is because peahens demand it. So peahens prefer to mate with males that have more eye spots on their trains. And, um, and therefore we have these beautiful trains and displays. And so, um, so we know that males benefit from having the displays because that means they can mate more. Um, but what, what's in it for the female? So in the peacock and in the sage grouse that I'll talk about today, Males don't provide any parental care. And so uh, after the female mates with the male, that's the end of their relationship. And she takes care of the young entirely on her own. So what is she, what's in it for the female and making sure he has a lot of eye spots basically. Um, and so we, there's a lot of research on this question still, still going on, but, um, but right now we think it's because females benefit from being choosy if male display traits convey some sort of information to her about benefits that females can gain from their mate choice. And that can include genetic benefits. So basically better genes for their offspring. And that could be genes that are better at immune response or any sort of body condition or simply for sexier display traits. So um, the sexy sun model is one of the, one of the leading contenders right now. Um, and so it could be genetics that she's 
picking something about the genetics that her offspring will have, or there could be some sort of direct benefit. And in a species like peacock, where males don't provide parental care, that might be something simply like avoiding parasite transmission during the actual act of copulation. And so these are the reasons why we think females might be choosy about their mates. But when you actually watch animal courtship in the wild, we see that it's often more like a ne negotiation than an advertisement. So it's not just that the male unfurls his train and the female counts the eye spots and then that's the end of their courtship. There's usually all sorts of interaction and interplay between the males and females. And, um, and there's a whole bunch of things that, that from the, just focusing on the male perspective here, that there's a bunch of things that he has to get right in order to be successful in courtship. So he has to choose an appropriate location to try to attract the female. And he has to tr uh, choose an appropriate partner to try to court. He needs to approach the female without scaring her away, which turns out to be harder in many species than you might expect. Um, and then once he approaches, he has to interact appropriately doing whatever that species does during courtship. And they need to produce their most attractive display given female preference, which might vary between old and young females and all sorts of things. And it might also, uh, they might also adjust their display according to what other males are doing to just be better than the next guy. And they often do all of that within whatever energetic constraints they're working with, right? They have a pool of energy that they have to spend to do all of this stuff. And these are complex tasks and individuals may differ in their ability to do this, right? Their skill in executing these tasks. And, um, and so we can think about that as a courtship skill or a social skill. And so this example here is in the peacock spider. Um, hopefully you're able to see the video moving around there. Um, and what you can see here is the male is trying very hard to court this female and show her his beautiful display traits. And the whole time during courtship, she's trying to catch him to eat him. And so if he fails to convince her that he's an attractive mate, she'll just eat him. And so the courtship is really, that's a pretty extreme case. I, I don't know of any birds that, <laughs> that have uh, sexual cannibalism during courtship, but uh, it's spiders, it's pretty common in spiders, but he's sort of dancing for his life there. And so he's showing off while also evading a hunting female and dealing with all sorts of different things during courtship. And so that's an extreme case, but, um, but we see examples of that in all sorts of different species. And so sexual selection may favor not just elaborate display traits like you know, the peacock's train and more eye spots, but also the social skills needed to execute courtship successfully. And so that's been one of the things I've been interested in in my research um, throughout my career so far. I keep coming back to that question of how, how uh, sexual selection can lead to the ability to interact with others, right? So dealing, uh, leading to social skills and social intelligence. And so a uh, few studies have examined what we call a fitness consequences of social skills and courtship. So basically looking at how the ability to court appropriately, the ability to do each of those things we just talked about affects their ability to reproduce, right? So do individuals who are better at these things mate more often, um, suggesting that their, their uh, behaviors are favored by sexual selection. And so very few studies have done that because it's really hard to do, especially in the wild. Um, the first thing you have to do is you have to get all these detailed measurements of the subtle behaviors. So looking at the back and forth and the movements and interactions. And that's often very hard to do, especially in birds. Um, most species that you guys see, you might never see them actually mate because they'll do that way up in the trees and it only takes a few seconds. And so it's just hard to study these things. And, uh, and it's also really difficult to figure out who's responding to whom. And so uh, in particular during these courtship interactions, where they're both, there's interplay of both parties. And so if you wanna measure the social skills of the male, you have to somehow take into account that, they're, that all the females are different and vice versa, if you're interested in measuring the skills of the female. And so one way to handle this is to control one side of that interaction experimentally. 
And so that's one of the uh, tricks that I've used in my research. I got started doing this as a PhD student studying bowerbirds in Australia. So this is the satin bowerbird. And this is the female satin bowerbird robot, the fembot satin bowerbird that I built way back in 1995. Uh, and with roboticists, I didn't, I didn't do the whole technology myself, but, um, but basically I put this robot into the bower where the male would normally be courting a female. This is a real female up here and the male will come down and court the robot. So I can control one side of that conversation and then measure how males respond and do it in a way that allows me to compare among males on a level playing field. And so only a handful of studies have been able to, to tackle that issue because there just aren't that many conditions where you can get away with using a robotic female bird. As you know, for most species, they fly around and do things up in the trees. And so, um, so you, you know, in most cases, you can't get away with this. The bowerbirds were, um, were an interesting situation because courtship always happens in a very uh, known, pr predictable location right in the bower. And um, the sage grouse that I'll tell you about today, they also always court on the ground out in the open um, on these breeding leks. And so that is one of the reasons why I've focused on these different species. But so we've been using sage grouse as a model system to examine sexual selection on social skills. And so when I say we're using it as a model system, I mean that um, we are very interested in the sage grouse by themselves. I'm fascinated by sage grouse and I wanna know all about them. But the focus of the study is to try to use sage grouse as a model to understand the process of sexual selection more generally. So hopefully what we find would be applicable to uh, peacock spiders or peacocks or any other species. Uh, and so we have been looking at a few different types of social skills. And the one that I'll focus on today is uh, tactics that males may use to produce attractive displays when there are trade-offs between different components of the display. And so I'll tell you about how we have been doing that. And then I'll talk a bit about how our basic research, so that curiosity-driven research, informs our more conservation-focused, our more applied research. And I'll talk a little bit about how foraging behavior affects courtship and mating success. And that relates to understanding how they use the habitat and what makes good habitat. So that has a very strong connection to conservation. And also I'll briefly tell you about our studies of the impacts of noise pollution on breeding behaviors. So that is a map of where we're going. But uh, first, just briefly, why are we interested in conservation of sage grouse? Um, it's a huge, huge issue. So sage grouse populations have declined by about 95% from the uh, historical records, so pretty dramatic. And they've lost, lost about 56% of the habitat. And so the lighter color here is their historical range and the green is their present day range. And you can see they're, they're still very widespread. Um, they're, they're all over the interior west, but they've lost about 56% of that habitat. And so over the last few decades, the sage grouse have been the focus of one of the biggest, um, arguably the biggest conservation efforts in US history, focused on a single species um, to avoid the need to list them as endangered. So they are not listed as endangered. Um, and we've, the, the idea was to have this preemptive effort to protect them so that we don't need to list them as endangered. And so that's been going on for a few decades now and a lot of money is being um, thrown at the problem. I don't mean thrown like uselessly thrown, most of it's fairly well spent, but, uh, but there's been a lot, a lot of effort on this. And there's still a lot we don't know about what makes good sage grouse habitat and what we can do to protect it. So that's part of what we've been doing in our work. And most of the research I'll talk about today was done in Lander, Wyoming. So this was our field site for a long time. It's just spectacular. It's in the Rocky Mountains and, um, and we're just a little bit east of the Wind River Range, um, which is part of the Rockies. And it's, yeah, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful place to work. And 
so here, this is just one of the snowy days where we woke up and there was, I think a foot and a half of snow and the sagebrush just looked like this rolling sea. It was totally amazing. And so that is where we've been working. Uh, more recently, we've been doing research in the Eastern Sierras in California, so closer to home. And um, I should have had that on the map too. Our most recent field site is in the Santa Rosa Mountains in Nevada. So we have a few different sites where we've been working on these birds. But this is our site in Wyoming. We would go out there every year and set up our own little trailer park in the middle of nowhere out there. And our crew would live out in the sagebrush so that we could be closer to the leks. And we had crews that came from all over. So every year we would bring in a different crew. These are mostly, um, that was a particularly epic field crew photo that's worth pointing out, but um, it's a lot of fun out there. But we have people, most of them are just, just finished undergraduate and are looking for some experience before they go on to graduate school or look for a permanent position. And so all of them get big thanks for helping make this possible. And so we are out there to study the sage grouse on their breeding grounds called leks. And so this is a sage grouse lek. This is one of the biggest remaining leks in the range of the species. It's uh, in Wyoming. And this lek, I believe, um, I don't remember exactly what the high count is, but it was somewhere up in the 400 or 500 birds there. So I don't know if you can, how well you can see this on your Zoom screens, but all these little white dots here are males. And so they're all strutting here. And there are females in there too, but the females are brown and they blend into the sagebrush. So they're very hard to see. Um, but the, in the mornings during the breeding season, the males will show up before sunrise and start strutting and they'll continue strutting for a few hours. It, it's variable depending on the day and um, temperature and their level of desperation, <laughs> how long they stay out there. Um, but they'll be out there for a few hours every morning during the spring breeding season. And so males puff up and strut around and females show up at comparison shop for a mate. Once they've decided who they wanna mate with, they copulate on the lek and then that's the end of their relationship. She goes off and uh, takes care of the young on her own. She may mate another time with the same male or a different male, but there's no, no ongoing relationship. So this, hopefully you can see a video here that's a time lapse of a morning on the lek during the peak of the breeding season. And so these are all the males and you can see how many hens are out there. It's a huge number of females. And so I'll stop talking so you can just hear them. So at the end of the day, a raptor was, someone spotted a raptor in the area and everyone took off, even that last guy. So that was one morning during the peak of breeding. And um, there's usually about a week long peak of breeding where almost all of the mating happens. And so that was the, the day where a lot of the actual mating happened. And you can see it's a madhouse of tons and tons of hens all gathered around a few different males. So this is what that looks like up close. And um, hopefully this video is working for you guys. Are you able to see the videos pretty well? We have yeah. so far. Great. Um, and so this is a close up of a male strutting. And um, so just a few of the things to notice, <laughs> they're pretty obvious, but uh, beautiful spiky retrices, um, the combs over the eyes that are um, enlarged while they're breeding. Um, the rough of white feathers around their chest, vocal sac, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of different traits that are all involved in convincing females to mate. And um, you'll notice when he turns his back to us that he has a pattern of white spots uh, on his undertail covert feathers. And we take photos of that pattern and we call it the butt print. And we can use it to recognize them as individuals within a season. 
And so we, we do ban some birds, but a lot of them we just recognize entirely by their butt prints. Here's the butt print. <laughs> so the first part of the display where he's uh, swooshing his wings across the feathers on his chest, that sound is a mechanical sound. It's like stridulation of an insect, like a cricket would make sound. And so the, the feathers on their chest are very spiky and um, they get worn away during the season. So they become even more spiky and they rub the, um, the, you know, the front of their wings across those feathers to make that sound. So that's a part of the display is that mechanical sound. And then that's followed by the vocal sound and, um, and it's, it's brief, but they do this over and over and over again all morning long. And we'll show you a little bit about how we've been studying, whoops, the, um, let me pause that for a minute. Um, so to study just how they make these sounds and, um, and the different components to try to understand the physiology of this and the physics of how they do this, because it's, as you can tell, not a very bird-like sound. It's a pretty unusual, a usual thing that they do. And so we've used high speed video. And so this is one of the high speed videos in 250 frames a second. And so you can really see the details of what he's doing. So this was a snowy day. So he starts out running towards the camera and you'll hear him strutting in real time. And then um, after that, uh, we'll see the very super slow-mo version of it. That's a different male off camera that you just heard. So it's pretty extraordinary. Um, and weird and very unbird-like in a lot of ways. Uh, and so if you wanna see that better, I don't know what the quality ended up being like on your end, but, um, but down at our YouTube channel, you can go there and see these videos that we have posted. And if you can watch that video with, on, a, on a speaker with a good subwoofer, it's worth it <laughs> because you'll hear all these low frequency sounds that, that won't come out of a, a typical computer audio, but are quite amazing. So this is, it's an extraordinary display that they do and they do this over and over and over again all morning long. Okay, so that is their courtship display. And so, um, so now we'll talk about the tactics to produce attractive displays when there may be trade-offs between different components. So just a little bit of background, what do we know about sexual selection in sage grouse? Um, we know from lots and lots of research that females are very picky. So they almost all want to mate with one or maybe two males on the lek. Almost all the females want to mate with the same few males. And just to give you a sense of how extreme that can be is uh, this image right here. This sage grouse male is a legend in our project. So he mated more than any male that we've ever monitored. And so this one guy in 2014 on Cottontail Lek just totally dominated breeding. Um, there were, I think, 60 males out there that year and almost nobody but him made it. And you can see him here surrounded by hens. And so he made it well over 130 times during that breeding season. And 30 of those copulations happened on the morning while I was sitting there and took this photo. 
And so during a window of maybe two hours, he mated 30 times and 23 of those matings were in a single 23 minute long period of time where he mated once a minute for 23 straight minutes. It, it was very impressive. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it only lasts like six, 10 seconds each time, but it's nonetheless very impressive. So he, all the hens went nuts for him and it, it was fascinating to see. Um, and we've never had anybody that was that, um, that dominant. Usually there's a top guy and sort of a few middle tier guys and a few guys that get a few matings, but not that year. Uh, but that, that gives you a sense of how strong sexual selection can be. Because if you can be that guy, the, you're going to pass your genes on a lot to the next generation, right? His genes will be very disproportionately represented in the next generation. And so, again, females are very picky. Uh, we know that. They all want to mate with the same few males, but it doesn't seem to be about looks. So as fancy as they are, we haven't really found uh, that variation in the, the um, visual display traits that we can measure well is related to mating success. It doesn't mean that it's unimportant, but it, that doesn't seem to be the thing that differentiates the super sexy sage grouse from all of the other guys out there. So we know that successful males do that strut display that you saw in the video. They do that at a high quantity. And so they spend more days on the lek and while they're there, they're working really hard. So show up and work hard is the most important part of success for a sage grouse. And then display quality is also important. So there's a particular aspect of the vocalization that females seem to prefer. And um, it's something that we can't even hear. So we can't hear the difference between an attractive and an unattractive sound according to the female sage grouse. So quantity and quality are both important. And we know that displays are energetically costly and studies suggest, previous studies suggested this possible trade-off between quality and quantity. And so quality quantity trade-offs are very common in the world, right? You can either do something fast or you can do it really well, but it's often very hard to do both of those things at the same time, right? And, and so there's evidence that there's this quantity quality trade-off that sage grouse also face in their displays. And so we examined whether males, they basically have to juggle this, right? So they know that females want both quantity and quality. And so how do they maximize both of those things? And so we examined whether males sort of manage that trade-off by tactically using their energy when it's most likely to lead to matings. And that is when females are close. So we know from previous studies that when females are close, that's when she's really paying attention to the rate of display. And from a distance, the quality seems to be more important, which is a little counterintuitive, but, but, um, but we think that quality is important from a distance and quantity is more important up close. And so we wanted to know whether males were adjusting, whether they were basically gaming it so that they really ramped up their strut rate when the female got close so they can put on the best show when it matters the most. So that's what we set out to test. And in order to do that, we needed to measure how males adjust their rate of display as the female gets closer to them. And so we wanted to do that in a controlled way. And so this was the first version of the Fembot sage grouse. And it's pretty primitive. <laughs> it was on G scale model train tracks and, um, and it worked. <laughs> and so that is me building it. And this is what it looked like when it was done. So this was our first generation robotic female sage grouse. And she has a microphone right there that it's about at ear level. So we wanted to be able to measure the sounds that the female hears from her perspective. And we also have a little video camera on board right there. And so she moves on G-scale model train tracks and it allows us to control, uh, create this controlled stimulus that we can measure all males and how they respond to the female. And it also allows us to measure male display from the female's perspective because of the audio and video on board. And so do they fall for it? Yes, they do. Uh, and so it's, it's not hard to fool a male sage grouse, <laughs> turns out. They, um, when they're not 
trying to mate with females. We often find them trying to mate with dried cow pies that are sort of, you know, <laughs> brown and round and approximately the size of a female sage grouse. And so, um, so, you know, they're pretty excited to just mate. And um, so we had to make her more attractive than a dried cow pie, basically. But males don't court the cow pie. So she had to be attractive enough that they would actually want to court her. But the bar is fairly low for convincing them that this is real. So here's the video from on board the robot. So hopefully you were able to see what just happened there. Were you able to see the whole video for the most part? We saw the video. I'm assuming they mated, but I'm not sure. Um, well, he mated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he tried. So he, 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 was he tried to mate with her and it, that didn't end well. But we that was very early on in the study. And we figured out from that point on how to avoid that. Um, and so that was one of the early early examples of the robot in action, but clearly they, they think she's real, basically. That's the take home message there. And so some of the other methods that we use while we're out there, we use a lot of um, video cameras and uh, to monitor all their behavior, but then to measure the sounds, and we wanted to measure the quality of the sounds. And in order to do that, um, if you were able to hear that first time lapse video, it's just blah, 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 right. Like they're all strutting all the time, and so it's really hard to pull apart the sounds of your target male that you're interested in from all the other males that are out there. And so, in order to do that, we set out 24 different microphones across the lek. We buried all the cable, 2.4 kilometers of cable, running into a hunting blind at the edge of the lek. And we recorded from all of those different microphones. And by doing that, we can um, triangulate the position from which the sound originated. So this is the same uh, strut display from one male as it arrives at each of the different microphones. And you can see the differences in arrival time. And we can use that to figure out where the sound must have originated. And there's software that allows us to do this. And so we're able to take that whole mess of vocalizations and tease it apart and assign different vocalizations to different birds. And so what did we find? This is the very abbreviated version of our results. But like I said, if you're interested in more in the um, details of the science, I'm happy to um, send you some papers or answer questions about it. But this was all done with my former postdoc, Alan Krakauer. Um, so he was a huge part of all the research I'm talking about today. So we found that males adjust their display rate in response to presence and absence of the female and proximity of the female. And so basically as the female gets closer, the male struts faster and faster and faster. And he's able to then put on a really good show when the female is up close, which is when she's most likely paying attention to that display rate. And so males vary in the amount that they do this. Um, the less successful guys just sort of blast away at a mediocre level all the time. Whereas the more successful guys would ramp it up when the female got close and then able to put on a much higher maximum display trait um, or display rate. And so more responsive males were able to increase their quantity without showing a decline in their quality and are more successful because they are able to do that. And so this suggests selection on social skills. And so in this case, it's being able to read the room in terms of who is there. So, um, so responding to the presence or absence, but also the proximity of females and adjusting their display accordingly. So males better at executing this tactic mate more often. And so one of the things we wanted to know was whether males also respond to the signals and cues they're getting from the female. So not just proximity, but what the female's actually doing. 
And um, one of the behaviors that we notice that's very highly variable among females while they're out there is that most of the time when females are on the lek, they're just foraging around. They look like they just happen to be there foraging and, um, and are not you know, spending any particular time around one male or seem to be paying attention in any close way. They just forage around. And the other behavior we see is that they spend, they will spend some time more upright and sort of attending to the general direction of a male. And we noticed being out there that they were more likely to spend time upright while they were getting closer to mating. So females that are foraging around seem to be quite a long ways away from mating. And once they start getting closer to mating, they spend more time upright. And so to quantify that, my graduate student, Anna, measured all sorts of details about their behavior and found that that's basically true. So a female that's foraging around is very unlikely to transition into soliciting a copulation, which is what you see in this image here. Um, whereas when the female is upright, she's much more likely to transition into soliciting a copulation. And so if a male wanted to target a female that was more likely to actually mate with him, he should be spending more effort on a female that is in this upright position and is actually looking like she might mate. And so there's information there, right? There's, there's information in that behavior that the males could use um, to adjust their behaviors accordingly. And so do males respond to that difference in behavior? And so for this, we needed a more sophisticated robot that could do more than just cruise around on train tracks. And so this is, I worked with a different set of engineers here. And, um, and this is what it looked like without the sage grouse on it. So it looks like an escaped rotisserie chicken. Um, and then we, I actually used a pair of Spanx, you know, of, um, very uh, tight pantyhose basically to use, you know, around the neck to try to get the thing to move in a natural way. I played around with all sorts of arts and crafts to, um, to make this work. And, and I learned a lot about taxidermy um, and so this is in the process of putting this together. These specimens, by the way, were all collected from um, game and fish freezers across the state of Wyoming. And so I put out a call and told them that if anybody comes in with a dead sage grouse that's in good condition and is a female, then to save it for me. And so these were all birds that died um, for a variety of reasons, often auto accidents but they weren't collected just for this. Um, but I gave them a new life. So here we have the finished robot put together just to show you what she looks like. And, um, and so here she is showing off her uninterested behavior while she's pecking at the ground. And um, down below we have a robot who's doing more of this interested behavior while she's looking back and forth. And, um, and, that's, and we can drive her around, she's not, restricted to train tracks. So it worked much better than the other robot. And so what did we find with this? Um, here she is, by the way, in, um, in her glory being courted by a male. So um, what did we find? We find that males do respond to female behaviors by adjusting their display. And in this case, it turns out that the most successful guys, when a female is close to them, they just go for it. They put on their they strut as fast as they can. And um, it's the least successful guys that are probably more constrained in terms of their energy that are the ones that are making the adjustment and really only strutting a lot when the female's already showing signs that she's interested in mating with him. But the males are adjusting their behavior and we see differences in how they do this according to their success in mating. So, just a general statement about what kinds of things we found. Um, we found that measuring courtship tactics relative to fitness, relative to their mating success, we gain a more complete picture of how sexual selection acts on display. So it's not just about driving the evolution of these bizarre traits, but also in how the males use them during courtship interactions. And we can understand more about how sexual selection can favor social skills. So the ability to interact well and these results also suggest that the acquisition and allocation of energy is an important determinant of courtship success. And so we know that this is energetically costly from previous studies. 
And so what these studies that I've told you about so far, it's all about allocating that energy in a tactical way to put on a good show. And so that gets us to the connection to conservation. So how um, what we've been talking about so far relates to conservation. And um, in particular, we've been interested in how foraging behavior and diet quality relates to mating success. And so in the experiments with the robot, we found that males show this really dramatic seasonal decline in their display effort. So this is their courtship effort. It's a measure of the rate at which they produce this display. And this is the number of days after the peak of breeding, which is when most of that copulation happens. And you can see it drops off pretty quickly over that next month. And so the odds of continuing a courtship bout drop by about 6% per day. So in other words, they're just getting tired. <laughs> they're, by the end of the season, they look really worn out. And we know that the sage grouse are sagebrush obligates. So they rely on sagebrush almost exclusively in the winter and early spring when um, other food isn't really available yet. And uh, sagebrush has protein and fats, um, but it's also full of toxins that the plant produces to defend itself against herbivores. So anyone who's ever been out in the sagebrush sea knows how smelly it is. Um, it has hundreds of volatile chemicals in it that um, seem to be about deterring herbivores from eating it. And so it's a difficult thing to make a living off of eating sagebrush basically. And it's not easy to be sexy as a sage grouse. So previous studies have shown that what they do is energetically costly. And um, previous studies have also looked at the, what we think of as the trajectory of male condition and show that it differs with success. And so here's what I mean by that. So this is body condition. So how much body fat they have. Um, and this is the date in the breeding season. And they found that unsuccessful males, so males that are out on the lek but aren't successful at convincing any females to mate with them. Those males start out pretty fat, so they have a lot of body fat, but they drop a ton of weight during the breeding season. The non-territorial males, so males that aren't even able to get a territory on the lek, start out fairly lean and end up really skinny. But the successful males start lean and athletic and they stay that way, which actually kind of makes sense, right? That you would like a basketball player starts the season in shape and stays in shape the whole time. Um, and so there's just differences in how these successful and unsuccessful males are managing, or there's something about the way that they use energy or are able to replenish their energy after a hard day of strutting on the lek. And there were also hints from this study that these successful males were foraging farther away from the lek, presumably getting better food that's able to replenish their energy after the days. And so all of that leads us to think that diet and energy uh, is just a huge part of what makes a successful male. And so uh, we've been working with um, friend and collaborator Jennifer Forby from Boise State University to do this work. She's a professor there. And her lab's been looking at what makes food better for a sage grouse. And so previous work from her lab, um, which was done on birds in Idaho, found that the birds are selecting for plants with a lower level of toxicity. So they have a lower concentration of, of um, anti-herbivory chemicals and they have higher protein levels. And so um, the plants that are, were browsed by the birds, so they were taking bites from them, have low concentrations of toxin and high concentration of protein um, compared to random sites and compared to the ones that were within that same patch but were ignored by the birds. And so they seem to be choosing plant by plant whether or not to eat it. Um, they're very picky. And so we've been looking at how diet affects these sort of tactical decisions and um, habitat quality and the diet quality relate to components of fitness at sites in Wyoming, Idaho, California, and Nevada. And we've been doing that using satellite tags to track the birds. So um, we were able to map out their foraging and roosting locations. And then when the birds show up on the lek breeding ground, we can monitor their behavior. So we can relate their diet intake to what they do on the lek. 
So this is just data from two days in the life of Steve the Sage Grouse. So this was his lek. Um, these were where he spent the night. And then during the day, he would move around and um, at these foraging sites one day and the next day he was a little bit um, further north. Uh, but it gives us a sense of where these birds are going. And so we then go out to these foraging sites where the bird was the day before. And, um, and so we don't disturb the birds while they're foraging there. We go to where they went the day before. And this was a particularly fun day where we walked out there in the snow. And on the snowy days, it's so cool because you get out there and you can see exactly what the birds did. And so these are sage grouse prints. And we are walking in the middle of nowhere and there's no sign of birds. And then all of a sudden we get to our GP GPS location and you look down and there's sage grouse tracks everywhere. So they were there as a flock. And you can see they'll move around and they'll walk up and here they browsed on this plant right here and then they walked away and there'll be other plants that you'll see they walk right past it and maybe take one bite off a leaf but then keep walking. And then they'll go to another plant and they'll just hammer it and you'll see it surrounded by um, sage grouse prints. So some sagebrush is clearly more attractive than others. And we go out there and look for the bite marks on the plant. You can actually look at the sagebrush leaves and there's a distinct uh, look of a fresh bite mark. And so we can tell which plants they're eating and which plants they're not eating. And so we then collect the plants and so we can get a sense of what they're eating and what they're rejecting. And, um, and we're analyzing all the toxins and nutritional content in the Forby lab. And so our goal is to learn how diet quality relates to that body condition, so their overall health, um, their display effort, and their mating success, and also learn about what makes good sage grouse habitat, because that is um, surprisingly still kind of a mystery. And um, especially in areas that are being restored after wildfire, we often don't know enough about what they like, what makes good habitat to know how to restore it effectively. And so a lot of those analyses are still underway. We're still doing the chemistry yet. So I, I don't know the answers to those questions yet, but that's one of the big things we're working on. And just a fun natural history um, detour here. This, was, this is out in the Eastern Sierras in California where we were doing some work for a while. And this is one of the foraging sites that we walked to and we kept seeing that tons and tons of birds were going to the same location out here. And so we walked out there into the sagebrush and there was a little patch of badlands. So it was a patch of clay soil um, that rose up above the sagebrush. And we were standing out there, we were looking at all the sage all around and we could not find any bite marks on the plant. So they were spending hours here, but we couldn't find any evidence that they were actually foraging. And at some point we looked down and realized that um, it, it's a, just, just to show you how beautiful the site is, that's the Sierras looking back um, and the Sierras. Uh, and, and so at some point we realized that they were eating the clay. And so we were standing on this clay mound looking around going, what are they doing here? And then we realized they were eating the dirt. And so, um, so we went out there the next morning early, early and I was out with my camera a long ways away and a flock of um, I think 30 or 40 sage grouse flew in and they fed for about an hour pecking at the clay. And then they flew off at the end of the morning and went somewhere else. And so it, this is a site where they're eating clay then the clay helps bind up the toxins in the sagebrush. And so we were able to identify this as an important site for protection and um, it hadn't been on the radar of the local conservation agencies but now they're keeping it protected. So that was just really fun. That was a cool thing to stumble across. Uh, and so they move around a lot looking for good sagebrush. And so it's, um, you might wonder why don't they just find a place and then eat there every day? Um, it's because the sagebrush has tactics also. Um, so sage grouse are not the only obligates. This was a fun day where a pronghorn showed up on our lek. Um, pronghorn also rely on the sagebrush in the winter and pygmy rabbits are present in a number of their different locations. And um, this was one of the pygmy rabbits we found out there. So the sagebrush responds to herbivory by increasing its toxins. So when it's being browsed by a plant, it, it starts increasing its toxic defense. And so as they continue foraging in a site, that site becomes less and less good as far as um, uh, the diet quality. 
And so we know that they did that during the summer and we went out and tested it um, in the winter to see if they, the same thing was true during the spring and winter when the birds really rely on it. And our preliminary results so far suggest that the sagebrush is also responding to herbivory in the winter by increasing its toxin level. So the plants also have tactics and the birds foraging around um, are basically interacting with the plants in a very interesting way. So just a little bit more about what we've been doing with our habitat studies. Um, we've been using some really cool technology. So this is um, a laser scanner. So we basically take it out into the field and set it up and it spins around and, um, and makes a laser scan, a three-dimensional laser scan of the entire area. So this is our truck at one of our LECs and it gets down to the individual plant. Um, so this is a, just a single plant that shows you the kind of detail that we can get with this. And so we can really quantify the habitat in a really um, uh, an amazing way. And we can then, you know, we can even put a sage grouse in there and find out what they can see and who can see them from any given location. So once you have one of these maps, you can move around on the map and measure all sorts of different things. They're very cool. Uh, and one of the most recent studies that we've been starting, it's in the Santa Rosa Mountains in Nevada, is looking at the impact of wildfire. So I'm sure you've been hearing plenty about wildfire in the West. And uh, 2018 was a really bad fire season. And this, there was a fire in Nevada, the Martin Fire, that took out 440,000 acres of prime sage grouse habitat, sagebrush, uh, in one single fire. And it was some of the best habitat in all of Nevada that was linking together populations from Idaho and Oregon. It was a real tragedy. And, uh, and so we just got started working out there. You can see, it's probably hard to tell on this picture, but, um, but as far as you can see in this photo, there is no sagebrush. That would have been solid sagebrush, but it just burned entirely. Um, this is another part of that site, and what you can see here is that there are little islands of sagebrush remaining, and then it's surrounded by mostly invasive grasses, sadly. Uh, and so this is what it's coming back like. They're trying to reseed and restore the area, and so my graduate student Maria and I were out there this last spring, and we'll go out there again next spring. And we're out there looking at diet quality and trying to track the birds to see how they use these islands of sagebrush um, in this remaining habitat while it's being restored. And hopefully, uh, hopefully the birds will stick around because the numbers were pretty low when we were out there last spring, but there are birds out there and they're using these little islands. So hopefully we can help inform restoration efforts by learning more about what they do out there. Um, we've also collected some data with um, Zooniverse. I don't know if any of you have ever tried this, but we, we used a lot of camera traps to collect data about the birds on the, on the LEX. And we put that online and we had um, anybody who's interested can go online and look at the images and answer questions about the images. And it allows us to collect data um, in a quicker way than we could do if we had to look at all the images ourselves. And it also gets the public engaged in the process of collecting data. We've done a lot of work with local high schools too, getting them out there to, um, to measure some aspects of sage grouse habitat and get them interested in the birds that um, most of them have never seen, or many of them had no idea that there were sage grouse around them. And let's see, so how are we doing on time? I can tell you a little bit about the noise, five more minutes or how are we doing? I think five yeah. minutes is good and then questions. Okay, all right. So. Um, so I'll just tell you quickly about the, our work studying the impacts of noise pollution on their behavior. And um, I'll just give you the quick summary of it. So uh, this is the Wind River Range. So I told you that our field site in, that I've been talking about so far was on the east side of the Wind River Range. This is the west side of the Wind River Range. And it happens to be one of the biggest natural gas drilling sites in the lower 48. And, uh, and it used to be some of the best sage grouse habitat anywhere in the range of the species. And it's now a, a very active industrial field and the populations crashed in this whole area. So there are a few remaining sage grouse strutting near the drilling rigs, but this male, for example, is the last one on the lek. 
and um, and most of those leks are blinking out now. So it's a big big impact on the birds and they wanted to know what they can do to mitigate that and one of the things that might be disturbing the birds is noise but noise mitigation is really expensive and so is it worth investing in noise mitigation you really need to know what part of the development is impacting the birds before you know how to mitigate basically and so my graduate student jessica blickley and i worked on this problem and um and so we went out and we annoyed a lot of sage grouse in the name of science so we recorded noise from that um, that industrial site on the east, or west side of the mountains, and then we went back to our undisturbed site on the um, east side of the mountains, and we played sound at them from speakers. And so these were undisturbed leks, and we were able to experimentally introduce noise to see whether noise alone impacted the birds, and the answer is yes. So uh, this is the change in the number of males that were on the lek from um, the baseline. So the baseline was when we started the study. So we were looking at how the attendance on the lek changed from the beginning of the study. And these were years where the population was increasing all across the range of the species. And what we saw is that, um, is that it increased in our population a lot more on the control leks, which were the light blue, than on the noise lacks, which were the dark blue. And so we played noise from drilling rigs, which is a continuous noise and noise from roads, which is the big rig traffic on these dirt roads out there. And so the control lacks um, were showing these big increases in attendance where we saw almost none in the noise lacks. And so um, there ended up being a 73% difference uh, on, um, on the road noise lex and a 29% difference on the drilling noise lex. So it had a big impact on lek attendance, the number of birds showing up. So the birds were moving away from lex that were noisy. And so they seem to be avoiding these areas. And we also found evidence of increased stress when we looked at the um, fecal samples and changes in their behavior. They adjusted their behavior on these noisy lex. So we found a number of different lines of evidence suggesting that noise is bad. So how loud is too loud? We went out and measured the noise levels um, in a bunch of those leks that are on the Pinedale side, that drilling, that oil and gas development field. We measured how loud it is on those leks. And then we looked at the lek trend. So these are leks that are either in the gas field or on the periphery of it. And, um, and so each of these points represents a lek. And so the leks were doing fine. They were sort of holding steady at around zero, meaning they, they weren't increasing or decreasing as you go up. And then when you hit right around here, they just tank, right? They do terribly. And the red dots are leks that have been abandoned. And so um, we found a significant threshold. There's a point you can, there's noise is fine up until a point and then it has a huge impact on the birds. And that threshold is about 25 decibels, which is really quiet, um, which is very unfortunate. It's just so quiet out there that any noise is just very obvious. And it doesn't take a lot of noise to, um, to drive the birds away and even lead to abandonment of those leks. And so we've been working with them to try to implement this threshold. And um, so male sage grouse attendance is negatively affected by noise, suggesting that they're avoiding these noisy areas and that um, birds who remain in these noisy areas are also impacted with higher stress and altered behaviors. And that the threshold of impact is very, very low, um, which is one of the reasons why these guys are having a really hard time with human development is they're just very sensitive birds. And, uh, and that research, that noise focused research and all the restoration and habitat research has been informed by the basic science. That's just our understanding of courtship behavior and um, interactions on the LEC. Um, it's been informed by that basic science at every step of the way. Um, the basic science helps us understand what's important about the sounds and behaviors, and then we can go look in these disturbed areas and see how that changes. And so um, there's a lot of interplay between the curiosity driven science and the very applied science on trying to figure out how to help these birds. So sage grouse have been an important model system in evolutionary and behavioral biology for decades. So we've been studying these birds for a long time to try to understand sexual selection and the evolution of um, lecking behavior. 
So this is a Nature Magazine cover from 1932. Um, it looks just like that dude right there. And um, so we've been studying these guys for a long time in science and um, humans have been relying on these birds for much, much longer. So this is a member of the Shoshone tribe doing the chicken dance, uh, which has tail feathers of a sage grouse make up his bustle. And they relied on the sage grouse for food um, and uh, they were a huge part of their culture. So they have been important to us for a very long time. And so now as their habitat is changing very, very quickly um, is, uh, and this is, this is the aerial image of that natural gas field I showed you pictures of. Each of these little dots is a, um, a different um, drilling platform, each of which is a few acres in size. So it's an enormous, enormous area. And it's not just natural gas, solar is going in. There's a lot of solar developments in sage grouse habitat that's removing a lot of good habitat and wind is another big one. So all these kinds of energy production have an impact. Uh, and we've also had a bunch of invasive grasses that have increased the um, severity and frequency of wildfires. So that's one of the biggest impacts on the bird right now. So we have been impacting them in a number of ways, directly and indirectly. And so as the need for conservation becomes more acute, there's more need than ever for cons uh, communication and collaboration between researchers focused on basic and applied questions. And I always just like to make that point because some of the stuff I do seems pretty esoteric that I'm <laughs> trying to understand, you know, the evolution of social skills or interactions between males and females. Um, and, uh, and yet it ends up being very important in the applied side of the work we do. And so in my lab, we're working at that interface and um, doing research on both of those things, which I think is important. And so with that, I will thank lots of people and I'm happy to take any questions. I will, um, I will read some of the chat questions. I'm gonna ask one basic question though, first, <laughs> if I'm allowed. Um, yeah. So do, do they, are they there on the Lex areas year round or they don't migrate? Um, you know, they do. So they're only there. I, I just actually, um, I anticipated this question. So I went to the BNA account, the Birds of North America and just pulled this up. But, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but basically uh, they're only on the Lex in the spring, but their spring happens early. So we would go out to Wyoming in the end of February. I'm looking at and, this. Um, and, you know, there's still tons of snow and we often had a really hard time getting to the Lex, but the birds are getting started very early. And then through March and April is when most of the mating happens. It varies a little bit by site. And then into May, they're starting to taper off. Uh, and so that is the season when you can see them on the Lek is in the early spring. And so it is cold out there. <laughs> if you guys do that sage grouse watching trip, well, you might end up being in hides or in buses or whatever else, but bring warm, warm. Oh, where, do, where do they go? I mean, where, where are they when they're not on the breeding grounds? So um, during the spring breeding season, they'll um, forage around off Lek. And then at the end of the breeding season, it's super variable among sites. And so the amount or the, the uh, distance that they migrate, whether they migrate at all, is actually quite variable. And so the females at our site in Wyoming, after the chicks hatched, as soon as all the chicks were hatched, they just start walking. And, um, and they would walk up to 30 kilometers and go up into slightly higher ground. And that was where they would spend the summer. And then they would come back down during the, um, winter to the area where we were and they would then be there in the spring um, but in other locations they'll go 60 miles in other sites they barely move at all and so it's really highly variable but they typically are not in the exact same place year round they're doing a little bit of movement but it's um not, fairly not small scale part. yeah okay okay i'm going to read questions why are people still allowed to hunt these birds <laughs> yes that's an excellent question um, and so my take on that, uh, and this is still, um, it is, con that's a very controversial issue. Um, and I have mixed, I do have mixed feelings. So first of all, they can't hunt across the whole range. So in California where they're really, um, really in trouble, hunting has stopped. 
Um, Washington, I, I really don't think they hunt them in, anymore in Washington. I'm not positive on that. But in most, of, most of the peripheral sites where their populations are in trouble, they have stopped hunting. But in Wyoming and a few other states, they do have a hunting season. It's usually only 10 days long and they have a small bag limit. And, um, and the hunting is just, it's not, it, it doesn't have a huge impact. So according to the models, it's just not enough to be driving the population patterns. Um, and for me, I, the hunters have been such a huge ally in the conservation efforts. And, um, you know, in our interactions with people in Wyoming, one of the things that's really striking is that people, everybody knows these birds because they grew up hunting them in, around our site. And so we just get a lot of this sense of affection and connection to the birds. Whereas in California, where nobody's been able to hunt them for a long time, most of the people had no idea they were even there. Um, and so I kind of feel like by, by stopping that, you break a lot of the connection between local people and the animals. So I've been, um, I've been agreeing with the land managers that that should be um, something that we only do if they really think it's necessary. And so far it hasn't gotten to that point. But if they end up on the endangered species list, then that will definitely be one of the first things that stops. Right, okay. Um... Next question, does fire, we have a, a bunch of fire questions, <laughs> not surprisingly, does fire rejuvenate sagebrush? Is it less toxic, create less toxic, higher protein? Not. Yeah, it's a great question. That is part of what we're trying to figure out in the study in Nevada. Um, we don't know yet whether sage that regrows after a fire is, um, is higher or lower toxicity. I could imagine it going either direction. And so that's one of the things we wanna find out. But Unfortunately, the way that the fires are playing out in the sagebrush sea is very similar to the way they're playing out in the forests across the West, which is that fuel buildup has happened for so long that when the fires burn, they burn really hot and huge. And so, um, you know, that fire of 440,000 acres that just never would have happened before invasive grasses. And so the main cause is invasive grasses. Cheat grass is the big, um, the big problem. So the grasses get in there, nothing eats the grasses. And so at the end of the, you know, by the time the summer rolls around, it's just dry grass, just waiting to be um, ignited. And that just wouldn't have been the case before the invasives showed up. There would have been just few little bunch grasses, but a lot of distance between them. And so now when the fires burn, they're devastating. So where we were in Nevada, they, it burned the sagebrush into the ground. You could find charcoal where the roots were. So it's not like the, there's no seed bank, there's nothing to come back. And unfortunately, as soon as it's burned out, the cheatgrass comes in and takes over. And then it's really hard for the sagebrush to get started again. So it's, an, it's a pretty depressing <coughs> situation, quite honestly. Um, but there's some things that they've been trying, including um, herbicides, just going in and killing off all the grasses and then reseeding it with native grass and sagebrush as quickly as they can, hoping that it'll get a leg up before the cheatgrass comes in. Um, and that seems to be working, but the scale at which it needs to happen now is just huge. And so it's a really big problem, unfortunately. So it doesn't, it would rejuvenate the sage if it happened in small patches as it would have in the past. And instead it is more devastating than not. So, and what about, next question, um, what about the sage grouse themselves, especially with this year's fires? I thought I heard that many died. Did they? Yeah, well, Washington was a really, really sad case, um, Washington State. So um, on the habitat map, there's a few isolated populations in Washington state that have been hanging on for a really long time now. And, um, but they don't have any interchange of birds between the main range of the species and these Washington populations. And so there's been a ton of conservation effort by some of my friends and colleagues that have been working there for years. And the fires that just came through took out the core piece of that habitat, they took out the majority of the remaining good sagebrush there. And that population that just burned was the one that would have been the source of birds for the other population. So it's devastating. So we will sadly, I think, see those populations blink out over the next, I don't know how long it'll take, but 
I don't, I, it'll take, it'll be very hard for them to come back from that because um, they just lost so much habitat. I don't know how many birds die in the fires. They're so huge. I'm sure many do. Yeah. Um, but even if they're able to get away, that there just won't be anything left for them if they go back. So that is a very, that was a very heartbreaking case. I'm sure. I was thinking about you through that whole thing. All right, yeah. now, so there's two more questions here, and then I'm going to let everybody go. Um, including you. <laughs> is, is the gas field on public land, federal or state lands? It's all public land. Um, in most of the areas where we've worked, the, the gas development is on public land. Um, and unfortunately, I showed you guys early on that picture of the lek in Wyoming that had 400 birds on it. Lewis and Clark described leks of 800 birds. And so, you know, they used to be huge like that all over the place. Um, but now those, there's only a few places that have huge leks like that. And they're almost entirely in Wyoming. That is why we were working there for so long. They're still locally pretty abundant. But that site where that big lek was, one of the biggest remaining leks, they just gave away permits to, to drill, which um. is just one of the, ugh, that was one of the most heartbreaking. And I just, I, I hope that maybe a very, very small silver lining of this pandemic is that the economics will no longer favor that. And by the time they get around to it, the, it won't be worth it. But um, they haven't started the drilling yet, but, um, but they're not, <laughs> there's ways in which Wyoming is being very proactive in protecting it. And there's other ones that are very disappointing and that was disappointing, but a lot of it is on public land. There is quite a bit on private land. In many cases, the landowners don't own the mineral rights. And so they don't even have a say in whether their land is drilled. Um, so it's very complicated. The different types of drilling have all sorts of different politics wrapped up in them. Okay, I'm gonna ask the last question and this it's, I know it's a long answer, but you'll have to <laughs> summarize it because um, I know it's complex. What conservation efforts are being done to protect the sagebrush steppe and the stage grass? So um, right now, I would say honestly that the majority of what's happening is just trying to uh, stop the bleeding, <laughs> honestly, right? Like they're just trying to, um, cover the wounds um, rather than trying to actively improve it um, or you know yeah it's trying to keep the wildfires down trying to figure out what to do about cheatgrass a lot of the things that they're doing um, are fairly small scale like there's you know there's um, a barbed wire fence across all sorts of barbed wire fence across the interior west and they're putting markers on that so the birds don't fly into it they're doing a lot of sort of small scale things like that but the biggest problem I mean wildfire and habitat loss dwarf all of those other things um, by just orders of magnitude and so you know the fire has really been over the last five years has just gotten so much worse and so I think right now the focus is really what can we do to um, to reduce the frequency and intensity of these fires, but also restore after the fires. So that has been the, um, the focus of it. And unfortunately, it's just like I said, it's such a huge scale of a problem that um, I don't know if we could ever do it to actually counteract the rate of habitat loss. So um, I hope they, they should, hopefully they'll be around for quite a while longer because Wyoming at least they're still doing quite well. Um, but I'm afraid we're going to see a lot of loss of different populations across the edges over the next few decades. But um, for everyone, and especially for you. <laughs> so, um, I, Sunny, do you want to unmute everybody so we can all say thank you? Um, yes, I'll do that. Hold on. And hello, hello, and thank you, uh, Gail. Thank you very much. Um, you know, as I say on every one of these Zoom meetings, the a silver lining in the pandemic is we could never have you come from California, but now we have you in our homes. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's fascinating research. And when we have more time, we'll have to talk about how you got into it, but I know we don't have time now. So just thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Thank you, Gail. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you. Awesome talk. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank awesome. you. Great yeah. talk. I will be back in touch with you, Gail, but uh, thank you everyone for attending. And um, 
I know that now we all really want to see sage grouse on the left. <laughs> yeah, I hope you yes. did. All right, take care, everyone. Thank Thanks you. so much. Very inspirational. Thank you. I wonder if Marie 